every time you said county home, it was the perception of people who didn't have anything. And it was not your home. You were leaving your home. I think they felt pretty well separated from people. I'm sure they felt, here I am over here in the county home, and I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a home for people who don't have a home was something that I had never seen or never observed before. Well, it, it was a feeling of, of uh, more or less helplessness for these people. They were there because they didn't have a place to go and they didn't have anyone to look after them or food or stuff like that. I went to Yakin County, North Carolina to look for my ancestors. I walked through the fields where they once lived and through the graveyards where they are buried. I looked on the 1880 Yakin census in hopes of finding my great-great-grandfather. And there he was, occupation, shoemaker, place of residence, almshouse. I just ached for him. What was he doing there? And why had he no one to care for him? What kind of people were we to have a member of our family living in such a place? But the shame slowly evaporated and turned instead into curiosity. What was this place? What was it like to live there? Why were people sent there? Do these places still exist? And a myriad of questions kept coming. So I set out to find some answers. The poor houses in the United States, they evolved from uh, their English uh, precedents, uh, the English common law, uh, provided for communities to take care of their, a certain amount of the poor. It was generally what they talked about as being the deserving poor, which were orphans, widows, uh, elderly people. Poor houses that were created, they varied from place to place. I mean, some of them were more elaborate than others. The treatment that the, as they called them, the inmates of the poor houses that they received would be some places was better than other because it, it really depended on local conditions and the people that were charged with uh, actually running the poor houses. They went there, they received food, they received shelter, they received attention by the community, by various church groups visiting. Uh, we know on one account that two of the caretakers at the county home, a husband and wife, wanted everybody to live like family. Everybody had something to do. Everybody felt valuable that they were making a contribution. Sometimes the residents' family would help pay their rent with uh, pigs, chickens, and eggs, or whatever they had that the county home could use. I think the county was required by law to care for these people. I think they did the very least they could do. Uh, obviously by putting them on a farm. Uh, they did what other inmates did throughout the state, whether it be prisons or county homes, that, that the county home had to be self-sufficient. The residents had to look after each other. There was mamas and daddies among the group. And they kind of, and the mama on the women's side was named Dora. And the, and the daddy on the men's side was named Ross. And Ross and Dora was, was the main two residents or inmates that everybody, that all the rest of them looked to, to, to make certain that they got their needs met. In the 18th, late 18th and 19th century, and I guess, you know, in many places well into the 20th century, there were not necessarily, you know, state-run orphanage facilities, and so children whose parents had died or for, you know, whatever reason, they, their, their parents were no longer 
uh, able to take care of them, they would oftentimes find themselves in the poorhouse. Sometimes the uh, poorhouses would even advertise that, you know, we have children here, you know, if, if you're looking, you know, to adopt a child, you know, come to the poorhouse and we might have a child that would make a wonderful uh, addition to your family. I was born in an old Yankee County home. My mother wasn't married. And then she left. And she left us there. It wasn't good memory. It's not been a good memory for me. And then the people from the, what they called the crazy house, the ones that got better would come over and cook and feed us. And uh, I don't know what kind of job they done. My name is Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Lee Carter. And I was born in the county home in Yagin County. Of course, it was a scary place because there were some people in there. They old, there was old people and I was just a kid. Well, the only thing I know that I got food and I got a place to lay down and I don't know who took care of me because I was all over the place I hiding most of the time. I just remember that I can remember my sister we was in the county home together. I used to kind of look after her because I was a year or two older than she was. Well, I remember him uh, holding on to me. Just holding on to him, but I didn't know he was my brother. Like I said, uh, he just helped me by the hand. And I thought that little boy, you know, helped me by the hand. He wasn't with me anymore, you know. And it was sad. As far as I'm concerned, the only good treatment I had was after uh, my adopted mother and daddy got me. Yeah. Because the county home was a bad place. Uh, it might have been better that we had a roof over our head. Yeah. It might have been good that we had a little something to eat. Yeah. But as far as being treated like children should be treated, no. Every time I come out here, I feel like I'm looking for something. I found the buildings that still stand and the cemetery. I look through all these records and see who was born here and who died here. But I find that I just keep looking for something more. People shied away from and act like they were concerned. They didn't want to come there even after it was a rest home. There were some people that didn't want to come there to live because of that stigma of being an old county home and they didn't want people to think that they were poor and paupers and lived in a county home. Uh, you see some sort of out of sight, out of mind attitude toward the people out there. However, the local churches, whether they be Baptist, Methodist, or Quakers, went to the county home on Sunday afternoon and, and fed the inmates a meal and had a worship service. The churches were very much involved with it. Other organizations come. The JCs came and had a cookout for them a couple of times. And the Santa Claus came. And he was the funniest thing I've ever seen. He was drunk as a coot. <laughs> Different churches people would come, just different people from the communities would come. They would bring stuff at Christmas, you know, candy and stuff. There were some people from the community who came. Um, there was there was a few churches who would come. There was, a, there was a few ladies who would come and volunteer, a few garden clubs. But uh, for the most part, it was the same people who came all the time. No, I don't remember no churches coming down to help out or nothing like that. There might have been, but I don't remember it. I'm pretty sure we sang, kneel at the cross, kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there, come then and dun, dun, dun. We were giving something that you couldn't buy with silver or gold. It was intangible in a way couldn't pick it up like an apple and hold it in your hand. In 1848, Dorothea Dix wrote about a mentally ill man she found living in the Granville County Poorhouse. He is an unfortunate man for who years has been chained to the floor of a wretched room, miserable and neglected, his now deformed and palsied limbs attest the severity of his sufferings 
through these cruel restraints. If they were violent and they couldn't handle them, they put them in the crazy house. The, the crazy house the, in Yad, Yadkin County, I mean, it obviously was a building that was behind the main poorhouse. It was, you know, had, I believe, four small rooms and had the bars on the windows. It obviously was a place where either, you know, people who were, had mental illness or perhaps even people who were criminals would have been kept. The report of the grand jury, fall term 1905, Nancy Barber said she was kept in the madhouse three weeks and was not allowed to go out. She is an old woman and the madhouse is dark and uncomfortable. This must have been a terrible place to, to be there and hear the screams coming from this building of people who had been locked up for having nothing worse than a, than a, a mental illness. It was near Christmas time when I first went to the Yadkin County Poorhouse Cemetery. When was the last time someone brought flowers, I wondered. When people died, there was a, a building there that, it was kind of like a small building and it had these wooden boxes in it. And it seemed like maybe beside it was like a corn crib or something and then this other side had these wooden boxes in it. And uh, it, that was what they buried them in. We're now at the Yakin County Home Cemetery established about 1892 when the county home moved to this location on about 200 acres of land. And I kind of imagine that a wagon pulled the coffin from the county home, which is about a quarter of a mile north of here, down the road to this graveyard. The condition of this cemetery that we found five years ago was, was overgrown. It was very difficult to find any graves, any headstones or footstones. And uh, curiously, uh, 90 years ago, when the grand jury from the county came over to investigate conditions at the county home, they reported the disgrace of this cemetery amongst other complaints. This sunken place was a big clue to the cemetery. And we probed with a rod and found a headstone which qualified for a red flag. And then we found a footstone at the west end. This is a way of remembering the most neglected, the least among us, who through no fault of their own ended up in the poorhouse and had to spend out their days there. The poorhouse in Beaufort County, which lasts you know, early into the 21st century, is kind of an anomaly that it lasts that long because I think most of the poorhouses are gone, you know, certainly by the 1950s or the early 1960s, the last of them kind of disappear throughout most of North Carolina. I'm John Morgan, the retired Register of Deeds of Beaufort County in Washington, North Carolina. Beaufort County was the last county in North Carolina to have a county home. Um, it started out as being called the Poor House. The Poor House as, a, as an institution, uh, probably, well, in North Carolina, it begins to die out in the mid 20th century, a little bit earlier. Uh, part of that's brought on by the Great Depression and the programs that the government establishes. And so uh, over time there's not as much need for these institutions of poor houses that had existed for so long in North Carolina as these other state and federal supported and private supported institutions take the place of those services that had been provided by poor houses. My name is Mary Holman and I'm going to give you a tour of the women's shelter. This is the women's shelter, and I've been here for 11 months. What the shelter has produced for me is a home away from home. It's just a place to go, you know, to get out of the cold, a place to call, call home if you don't have one. A lot of people come and they just look at us and they think that we're homeless. A lot of us are here due to cer different circumstances. You know, it could be because we've lost our home, our jobs. We could be battered, you know. Um, we come from lack of substance abuse or some on substance abuse that, that will help you get off. You know, it's different areas, different walks of life that's here. But we all have to come together and become one when we come into a, a small place like this. And to me, the, one of the first rules in this is there but for the grace of God go I. Um, and that's one reason I think that we often try to put people out of sight somewhere so we don't notice them. Uh, because it's hard to be reminded that this can happen and in many ways it can happen to anyone. I think society puts a shame on being poor. Uh, 
particularly American society. And we're, we're unusual. I mean, throughout human history, 90% of people have been poor. And now it's expected that, well, nobody should be poor. And if you're poor, it's your fault or you have some great defect. So it's not some horrible aberration. It's really part of the human condition. For a while, there was a lot of talk about homeless people choosing that lifestyle. I think that's very rare. Th the pernicious thing about that myth is that it, it enables us to discount or disregard people who are, are suffering and are really at the lowest level of society and just decide it's their fault. But it's not a crime to be poor. The shelters are able to run the way they run, partly because people in the community are willing to come in and volunteer. Volunteers are big. We really do depend on volunteers to help bring not only their talents and treasures to the shelter, but also to give the homeless community a chance to interact with people who are more in the mainstream. It gives them a, a role model in some cases. It gives them a chance to, to, to create aspirations for a better life for themselves. We forget when we're dealing with, with difficulties and problems, people can still celebrate and support each other and uh, have, have very meaningful relationships. Many people shared their memories of the poorhouse. Some said that neighbors and churches came here to show compassion, while others said that the outside community was never involved in providing care. But it was clear that the inmates, the people who lived in this place, developed their own sense of community and cared for each other. It was also clear that the people here had a greater hunger, not just a hunger for food or shelter. They needed compassion. They needed company. They needed people here to hold their hands and sing to them. And I don't think we're any different today than we were back then. <laughs>